Hello and welcome back to the last session and the end of this Legal Tech Summit. We have an amazing panel today. We're having Federico Hernandez, which we, I will introduce now, and Paula Cumualdo and Molly Nichols from Hogan Lovells. And this is going to be a very, very interesting uh, panel and presentation. So I'm just going to go ahead and make the proper presentations. Federico Hernandez, with more than 20 years of experience in the sector, he is the partner in charge of the technology and telecommunications practice at Hogan Lovells in Mexico. He advises local and foreign clients to navigate the regulation in different telecommunications and technology matters. He has been constantly recommended through the years in the TMT practice by Chambers and Partners, the Legal 500, and Latin Lawyer. Molly Nichols, he, she is the head of Advanced Client Data Solutions at Hogan Lovells US, and she brings more than 35 years of experience as a litigator, law professor, and in-law firm management on issues involving information governance, data protection, electronic discovery in both civil and criminal litigation. She is responsible for developing the firm's global approach to the analysis of client data in matters using advanced technologies. Molly has advised law firms and multinational corporations on legal strategies for the review and production of electronic information in litigation and regulatory matters. And she is admitted to practice in Texas and the District of Columbia. And Anna Romualdo, she is recognized Hogan Lovell's practitioner in the field of data privacy, cybersecurity, and IT, advising local and multinational companies, including big tech companies. She has provided several trainings in the fields of artificial intelligence technology, data privacy, and cybersecurity and has been published several times, just to mention one of her most outstanding publications, A Turning Point for Tech, Global Survey on Digital Regulation. She has also been recognized by the publication Foro Jurídico as one of the most influential female lawyers in Mexico in the field of technology in 2019, and has been recommended in the sector by the Legal 500. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we have um, Federico, Anna, and Molly on the screen. Welcome. Thank you very much for sharing your presentations, your knowledge, and your expertise with us. And I'm going to go off camera and off microphone. The floor is yours. And whenever we're done, we're going to come back to you with some questions. Uh, thank you very much, and please go on. Thank you, Alex. Alex, it is a great honor to participate in the closing session of this amazing event. A lot of great ideas have been discussed in the past days. In this session, we want to give you the perspective of us as a global firm about artificial intelligence and some examples regarding its boundaries. There could be different limitations around in AI, such as the law and ethics, but how to understand and be aware of them? That is the question. For that, we have two extraordinary tech lawyers from Cohen Lovells. First, Molly Nichols will talk about some basic technical concepts of AI so we can have a better understanding about the subject. Secondly, Anna Rumalo will tell us a brief story about the complexities and challenges of AI. Afterwards, Molly will return to explain a few examples of AI tools used at Hohen Lovells for the benefit of our clients. Finally, the three of us will have a short chat to answer some exciting questions. Please, Molly. Thank you, Federico. Um, I would like to set the stage today for our, our topic. Uh, we're gonna be talking about AI in a, a couple of different contexts. We're gonna be talking about the use of AI by our clients um, as they run and manage their business and how we deal with that as outside counsel. And we're also going to be talking about uh, AI used by lawyers to represent their clients. So it's going to be helpful for me to talk about the definitions. 
And it's really understanding AI's black box. Yeah, I think we've heard that uh, terminology uh, throughout this, this program, uh, but I wanna set the stage on how we deal with it as outside counsel. So first, I think it's helpful on the definition of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. You know, our clients are using AI in their businesses uh, to suggest what to buy, suggest what to read, uh, to manage their business. They're using AI to uh, um, determine who to hire, who to promote, who to tenure, uh, also who to loan money to, uh, and what rate should be charged. Uh, and then we're seeing AI in the criminal context as well, you know, how to set sentences and how to use facial recognition to find criminals. So we're uh, seeing this uh, with our, our clients. Um, so the other concept we're going to be talking about is algorithm. And uh, the last presenters um, actually used an example of an algorithm that's not computer related. And I think that's very important to understand that it is a process or set of rules uh, to get to a result. So think about it as a recipe. This is an example to me as a lawyer that resonates. Um, uh, a, a cake recipe has a list of ingredients. We follow those ingredients and we get this wonderful cake. Well, let's assume we switch some of those ingredients and we had, we put the, we put salt for the amount of sugar that the recipe calls for. All of a sudden our algorithm has changed and perhaps our result isn't as good. So think about that as we walk through some of this terminology. Um, and some of the concepts with regard to our ethical and legal obligations. Now let's talk about algorithm uh, in the mathematical sense, in the computer sense. It is a mathematical uh, model that even a human can't read. It's using historic information to make a prediction. And the computer starts reading this and calculating a mathematical uh, model. It's a huge matrix of numbers that really only makes sense to the machine. At this point, I will turn it over to Anna to talk about AI's legal complexities. Thank you, Molly, and thank you, Juan Carlos and Alex. I'm thrilled to be here with this wonderful audience. Well, from its very beginning, AI had seemed like the holy grail of productivity. Just imagine tireless and error-free activities that are surely unbiased, because bias is human, right? Well, the current development of AI has reached a milestone because of two things, the processing power to train AIs and the huge amount of data available. But do, where does that data come from? If you're thinking about data generated through the use of social media, you're right. However, data has been hoarded many years before that, and that's why we have big data. Actually, you may remember the big data frenzy, but let me put the concept in a nutshell for you. Big data refers to data sets that are too large or too complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing applications, let alone human capabilities. Big data and AI complement each other. As AI becomes better, the more data is given. So what happens if we build an AI-powered system that has access to those huge amounts of data? Where does the data come from? Does it matter? Let's see two examples. Imagine I'm HR from a large corporation and I start using an AI-powered system to handle or help me with my hirings. Unsurprisingly, the AI keeps recommending me white males for C-level positions. I don't know how the AI came to the same conclusion that I should keep hiring certain males because there were no explanations or clear reasons for that decision. And I don't question it because after that, the machine made me do it. Second example, I go to the bank on a Monday and I ask for a loan. 
my application is rejected and I don't know why, neither the bank employee who is helping me. She just received the rejection and communicated it to me. What we, me and the employee, don't know is that the AI system found a correlation in all the data surrounding my loan application, and that includes not only my personal data, but also historical lending data. So the system finds out that loans granted on Mondays to people like me are less likely to be paid. What an odd correlation. But you know, like they said, data has a better idea. The first example shows us that AI can perpetuate inequalities. And the second example gives us a hint on the mysteries of the AI's black box. Well, we don't really question an AI recommendation because it was supposed to come from a mathematical model. So we assume it must be correct and neutral. Well, not exactly. That almost blind faith in mathematical models that makes us believe that they are immune to bias is actually called math washing. And by the way, Kathy O'Neill talks about this on her book. So when should we question those recommendations or decisions? At this point, I have two questions and you'll probably be with me on this. How come the AI system didn't tell me why? After all, there were no reasons and no explanation. And second, why does the law care? Ah, the lack of transparency was usually called AI's black box. And like Molly said, this refers to the part that we don't or didn't know about how the AI processed the input. We just knew it reached the result. But now we are aware that we need to access the how and the why. I mean, we can handle the AI's truth. In the words of the AI scientist, Stuart Russell, if the AI black box would have come from outer space, it would be wise to exercise caution in opening the box. But it is not. We design the AI systems so we can take control of them and we need to understand the source of potential failures. So we need explicable AIs, otherwise, how can we allocate the legal liability? In other words, how are we lawyers going to have fun with the deployment of AI? A number of organizations have been very vocal about the limits of AI systems, including universities and NGOs, such as the Algorithmic Justice League. But also, we need those explanations because AI's recommendations are very likely to have an impact in our lives and our personal data. For that reason, these challenges were addressed from a legal point of view since 1995 in the EU Data Protection Directive with regards to automated processing of personal data and automated decisions. Back in the day, the legislator caught a glimpse on the issues that could have come up although machine learning wasn't really in the radar. At that moment, AI wasn't what it is today because its big leap came on 2012. And later on, other provisions regarding automated decisions were also included in the GDPR. And this growing concern has been undertook in the EU draft proposal for the regulation of AI that were announced last April and that you listened in the previous presentation. Now you may be wondering, what is the AI regulatory landscape in Mexico? Well, the Mexican data protection regulations include a similar provision to the ones included in the 95 Data Protection Directive regarding automation. So we also have rights regarding automation. But, we, but unlike the GDPR, this is not explicitly under the section of data subjects rights. Also, the Federal Civil Code includes an article related to the use of risky mechanisms that could be applicable to the use of AI. In this part, I'd like to emphasize that cyber lawyers, technology lawyers, or whatever you may want to call us, are here to help clients to navigate unregulated and sometimes barely regulated environments. And we cannot just wait for the publication of a specific new law. AI should be capable to tell us the reasons for their recommendations. 
are they recommending something because it's been done that way so long that the AI decided to go for the most apparently safest choice, which involves repeating the same old pattern? In other words, was that a product of bias in, bias out? If an AI is trained by a human intelligence to perform human tasks, would the AI, would the AI repeat human success and flaws? Finally, Remember that AI is everywhere. It shapes our online experience. It determines the ads we see. It's in our works, in our car, in our smartphones. It's really helpful, but it's not flawless, not by a long shot. And because of that reason, we shouldn't be taking this technology at face value. Thank you very much. And let's go back to Federico. Thank you, Anna. But how legal firms are actually working with AI tools? AI can support lawyers in performing research and due diligence, provide valuable information through analytics and automate some legal work. Molly will get into that, including how at Hoa and Lovells we have developed a system using AI in order to analyze hundreds of resolutions of the Data Protection Authority in Mexico, an initiative put forward by Anna. I'm sure that Molly will clear some doubts about how legal firms can actually and indeed work with AI. The floor is again yours, Molly. Great, thank you so much, uh, Federico. And um, Anna, thank you for raising those legal and ethical complexities uh, in AI. Uh, generally, now I will focus on the legal technology and how AI can assist attorneys uh, in the representation of their clients. We believe AI is the future. Uh, and to coin a phrase, and I think uh, the, the name of this program uh, is the future is now. So, you know, looking at AI and how do we as a law firm use it, I think is a, a very helpful discussion to have. You know, we actually uh, use a lot of commercial technology and commercial technology that uses um, machine learning and analytics. And uh, it's, uh, you know, been very helpful, but we do find that there are gaps and there are gaps in the technology that we need to fill. And, and uh, we are very lucky at Hogan Levels to have a technology staff and software engineers that help us fill those gas gaps. So we do develop a bespoke process bespoke tools, um, but we always leverage uh, commercial uh, tools as well. So we stack them sometimes, which is kind of fun. You get the best out of the best out of the tools. Uh, but I do want to give you an example of a tool that we developed and how it uh, evolved. Uh, um, we actually wrote some code that became a utility to compare text in some claims that were being filed. And it was just used locally, but it was so successful that it has evolved into a tool where we use unsupervised learning to compare text across thousands of documents that are hundreds of pages long. And it's now a web-based tool that we can use by spinning up uh, cloud instances through AWS around the world. So it's that's how these things happen. It's, it's when is this tool useful? How can we make it better? And then how can we use it for a variety of clients? That particular tool we use in regulatory matters, we use in uh, litigation, um, and we have the ability to use it in uh, M&A, uh, corporate M&A uh, uh, matters as well. So using commercial tools, uh, we uh, like to develop predictive models that help our clients get through large amounts of data and to bring that most important data to the surface so our lawyers can develop the legal strategy for clients. So how do we do that? There are some actually um, really good commercial tools out there that allow you to build AI model libraries so that we can deploy these algorithms, these predictive models uh, through the data set to bring the, the information forward that's most helpful. So for instance, we could develop um, a uh, model that can be industry related. Let's assume we represent an automotive client and there's some sort of investigation into the seat belts. Well, we can develop a model to pull out all of the information concerning seat belts uh, within uh, that data set. 
We can also focus on uh, matter type, uh, behavioral uh, types and sentiment, uh, which I will talk about in a minute, but we can also get issue specific. Privilege is a big one. You know, we have clients who we represent throughout the world. We could actually develop a model library for them using privilege based on the jurisdiction uh, in which that the uh, matter uh, exists. Um, so we know we see big differences between civil law and common law jurisdictions and, and privilege would be handled differently, but we can develop uh, models that can pull that information out. So, uh, you know, this is uh, something that uh, we believe is very important uh, with regard to our clients uh, as the uh, volumes of data get greater and more complex. So uh, one of the tools that we use, um, one of the commercial tools we use uh, actually analyzes communications. Um, and so I wanted to just show this for those of you who haven't used this before, we find it that it's very powerful. Um, some of these uh, tools are, you're able to uh, see who's talking to whom about what, uh, and it's very helpful in investigations in particular, uh, but you could also put a sentiment analysis on there so you can find out if uh, the discussion is hotly debated or if it's positive or if it's negative. And those types of things are very helpful for us when we are um, looking through large data sets in an investigation. You know, we can also see if somebody's been on their work email and they decide that uh, they want to um, take the, the um, conversation uh, private. And so they go to their Gmail account. So we can see things like that through this type of communication uh, uh, analysis. Um, like I've already uh, talked about, um, we do develop proprietary tools like the uh, unsupervised learning tool that uh, compares text. This is one on the screen that we uh, developed uh, in Mexico. This was something that Ana requested uh, and we call the app. Uh, it analyzes the uh, privacy uh, decisions, the precedent by INAI. And uh, so we started kind of like on the uh, data comparison tool. Um, we started just writing scripts. Uh, we got the decisions and we started pulling out some of the metadata, the year, the procedure name, the party, all those things listed there. And we were able to develop data visualizations, which was helpful, but we were finding that it was still very labor intensive. Um, and so uh, I want to show you what we did to enhance this tool, and it was using AI. Um, we actually used a uh, commercial tool uh, that we ultimately used for a non-standard use. We used uh, Kira, which uh, we, you've heard some about that during uh, this program. Uh, it typically is used to compare contracts and uh, so it looks at different terms in the contracts and, and brings your attention to certain things. Well, we ended up training it on the opinions uh, by the, uh, uh, or the decisions by the uh, INAI. Uh, it took us a little longer to train because it was a non-standard use, so 75 to 100 documents. Um, uh, you can use lawyers, you could use trainees or any type of uh, law school grad that would be helpful for training this model. Uh, and obviously we have Anna and her team uh, who will do the, uh, the validation and the quality control there. Um, so uh, how did we teach it? Well, let me show you an example of, of what we did. So if you can see in the opinion here, um, under sanction, there were actually three different infractions in the top one. We trained the tool on each different infraction uh, so that we could find across all of the uh, decisions, we could uh, bring those particular infractions forward. Um, and then we also associated uh, the sanction with it. Uh, we also felt it was important to pull out certain things like the definition of personal data, uh, data retention language and data transfer language. 
So we used a commercial tool. It wasn't for its uh, standard use, uh, but it became very useful for us to develop this tool for Anna and her team. And uh, it now our uh, lawyers are able to look at these decisions uh, from a high level so they can get the data visualizations and pull out the information that's important to our clients to av advise them accordingly. I think at this point, um, Federico, I'm going to turn it back to you uh, for our brief chat on uh, AI. Great. Uh, thank you, Molly. We thought to have this chat in order to summarize some of the main issues that have been discussed these days and as a way to end the summit. I will start with a question for you, Molly. How many professionals and hours would have implied to have the same results of the app that you just have described? Yeah, so we started down the path doing it manually. So we were able to track um, how much time it saved. And we found that it was about 50% of the time. Had we done this manually, it would have taken you know just uh, that much more. Um, so it saved us about 50% of our time. Great. And Anna, do you anticipate regulation of AI for the legal sector or more generally? Well, I think the world is on a path for the specific regulation of AI. For example, we had the Algorithmic Accountability Act from the US in um, 2019, and there was a white paper from 2020 that ended up in the harmonized rules on AI uh, the, uh, from Europe. And I, I think there's a common element in, in these proposals that data is at the heart of regulation. And I'm talking, of course, about the usual suspects, but Asian countries such as China have interesting approaches. Thank you, Anna. Back to you, Molly. Is it worth the investment of AI for legal firms? Where can legal firms start? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question, uh, Federico. The, um, you know, clients are demanding that we be more efficient. Clients are demanding that our bills be less than they are. Um, and if we look at one of the reasons that the cost has gone up, it's because of the volume and the complexity of the data that we have to look at, that we have to analyze in order to provide the, the uh, representation. Um, you know, at some point, the old way just won't work. So um, using artificial intelligence um, is a great investment uh, for uh, law firms to use so that they meet the, the needs of the client, which is the efficiency um, and it's dealing with the complexity of the volume and complexity of the data. So then your second question is, uh, where can law firms start? Well, yes, you can invest. Uh, we're lucky at Hogan Levels. I've got a full staff of technologists and attorneys who focus on the application of technology um, uh, in our matters, um, but you don't have to have that kind of investment here. Um, there are actually um, uh, service providers that pr can provide the technology and also the consultation to use the technology. And that's really a great place to start is on a matter by matter basis, uh, working with a service provider. Great, uh, Anna. What practice area of the law can benefit most from AI? Mm, I think that's an interesting question and it may seem easy from a certain perspective. I think all areas can be benefited because every client is going digital. And I think that probably in the future, clients will be using AI as they now use office programs. What about that? <laughs> <laughs> and Molly, you were mentioning about the reduction and efficiency that AI uh, comes within. So what does the impacts of on AI in terms of the cost to our clients? Yeah, so what we have found in our use of these AI tools um, is that we can reduce the cost of a matter anywhere from 30 to 90%. 
Uh, it's based on uh, the reduction of attorney's hours. That's how you get that reduction uh, because the uh, AI actually gives you that efficiency. Um, in litigation and investigation matters that are very data uh, um, uh, centric, that have a lot of email and that type of thing, we actually found the cost savings is much more. Um, it's on the higher side of that range. It's in the 60 to 90% um, savings. You know, so frankly, doing it the old manual way of looking at every document really does not make sense. Well, those, those figures are very interesting. Uh, Anna, back to you. Can lawyers help in the development of AI systems or programs to be legal compliance in the outset? Uh, of course, but I think that's a very broad question. So I would say that lawyers need to understand, we lawyers <laughs> need to understand the system from the outset to make it legally compliant. So for example, for having a system that complies with privacy by well, its privacy by design, uh, we need to understand not only the legal part, but also the technical part, at least at its core. Otherwise, we cannot, we cannot be separated from the technical side. So yes, of course, we can help developing an AI system from the legal point of view, of course. <laughs> and why are some clients hesitant to allow outside counsel to use AI? You have mentioned already some benefits and some incredible figures. Uh, Molly, but there's still some reluctance. Yeah, and and frankly, this is the black box issue. So there are concerns about the technology uh, being used. Uh, what does the technology do? How do we know it's accurate? Are we meeting our legal obligations? Um, so this is something that it's very helpful for us to have the conversations with our clients to describe how the um, technology works and how we're using supervised uh, uh, machine learning to train the, the, uh, the machine to get the output that we're looking for. So I think it's really understanding you know, the, the data that's going in, the information that's going into the machine, um, and then, you know, what comes out at the end and, and how we're interacting with that data. But um, so I think it's that conversation, that explanation uh, that helps our clients um, understand what's happening and how that's going to benefit them. I mean, there's nothing like looking at uh, a continuous act of learning uh, um, tool. And as lawyers are coding that tool, they're finding what is relevant and the machine brings forward more relevant documents. And at some point in time, you'll see that there's like a cliff where you're not getting any more relevant documents or you know, very, very few. It's just minuscule at that uh, point. So you can show graphics, data visualizations that will show the, the client what is happening and it, it well, they will understand it and it will make sense. So I think you have to have those kind of frank discussions with your client. Right. And what about uh, responsibilities, Anna? What could be the legal responsibilities for using AI and making decisions with AI? Who will be responsible then? Mm, I think that if life gives you lemons, make terms and conditions. Like one of my favorite philosophers says, Jaron Lanier. So of course you have to abide local rules in this regard, but certain aspects regarding liability can be set forth in the terms and conditions. So we can help to uh, allocate liability in certain cases and abiding the law, of course. So for example, if you say in your terms and conditions, you should only use autopilot, I don't know what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. <laughs> you should only use the autopilot on highways, otherwise I won't be liable. And that's a reason, probably because the sensor vision only works properly on highways or probably because the, sensor, the sensors are not working currently good on traffic, I don't know. But there's a reason. Of course, uh, sometimes people don't uh, read terms and conditions. That's another story. But I think we can help 
in this part to, like I said, allocating liability on the terms and conditions. Thank you, Anna. And what, what, what is the interaction of the lawyer after we have a result from an AI legal system? Oli, you, you were mentioning before something around it. So can you expand a little bit more? Sure, yeah, I was talking a little about that during the black box uh, um, discussion we have with clients to talk about what that process is. So it's really, we don't wait until there's a result from the AI system. We're actually the ones training it. We're training the algorithm. So we are a part of the process throughout. Um, so, um, but once we get to that cliff I was talking about uh, with the uh, continuous act of learning, we have a duty as lawyers to do a validation. So we measure the output with attorney decisions. So this is our defensibility piece. I am, um, so we do some statistically sound sampling and we do some other things in order to uh, validate that the machine did what we told it to do. And um, so it, we're a part of the process, but we do have that validation piece at the very end that is very important. And Anna, how can we identify a bias or a problem in an AI system? Uh, I would strongly recommend to perform an AI due diligence. Probably we are very used to due diligence to uh, perform an, 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 I don't know, a merger, an acquisition, anything like that. But we have to be used to AI due diligence. And in those due diligences that, by the way, it's a surprise, we're developing right now how to do a due diligence on AI, you can identify if you're developing a system, um, the quality of your data. And if you're using an AI system, you're the client, how to identify the quality of the data and et cetera, et cetera. So it's mainly for developers and clients of the, of the systems. And I think that's how you can spot uh, at least uh, for starters, a uh, bias on an AI system. So okay. keep an eye on us. <laughs> and to what extent the new generation of lawyers should have technical knowledge about AI, Molly? Yeah, I, I actually um, disagree with the premise of your question that it shouldn't be the new generation of lawyers, but it, there should be a duty of technical competence of all lawyers. Our clients are using this technology. Um, they're asking us questions and what are their legal duties, um, whether they're, like Anna said, developing the technology or if they're a user of the technology and a part of their business. And we have to understand what the technology is that, that they are using and what impact uh, it has, You know whether um, it's the bias issue that we've talked a lot about, not only in our session, but in others, you know, um, or you know, if it's uh, meeting uh, legal obligations that we have um, in other contexts. I mean, that's what we need to understand is uh, what effect does the technology have, and it's not just AI technology, it's all technology, um, have on uh, what is the legal impact. So we have to have that duty of competence to understand what the technology does. You know, and getting to Anna's point about the due diligence piece, you know, uh, we can uh, get information about um, the, the algorithm and what the data is that's going into uh, the development of the algorithm. And those are the types of questions we, we need to ask and we need to dig. Um, but that, all, that comes into our technology competence. Thank you, Molly. Very interesting. Uh, if AI uses personal data to better train artificial intelligence based analytic models, what are the data privacy implications here, Anna? Hmm, that's a tricky question, and I see, and, I, and I'm seeing that it's the final question, so it's fine. So, well, uh, in Europe and in Mexico, um, we have the right the when our data is processed to by an automated system um, to oppose that process, and uh, in Europe, the, it depends on on how the the um, 
how the AI or, or why the, the, the company is using the AI system. But because probably um, there's an inexcusable use of the AI. But uh, the company has can, can also has uh, more obligations depending on the level of risk that um, were, uh, the level of risk were explained on the previous presentation. So um, the more obligations are like uh, record, record keeping, human oversight, um, accuracy of outputs, so um, there could be also additional provisions um, regarding the, the, the use of uh, personal data on AI systems. Like I was saying, I think it was on the, on the first question, data is at the heart of AI regulation. So in this example, we can, the, the audience may remember that um, I think it was three years ago, that there was a prohibition to use um, data from judges um, to statistical analysis in Lex Machina. So there was a privacy implication there. There that was like the beginning of the privacy implications, like one of the that hit the news, you know. And now there are much more privacy implications because you're if you're using, for example, personal sensitive personal data, or you're using general sensitive data, or, or why you're using this system to grant loans for, uh, or is this, is this job related, or for what? So I think this is um, uh, AI and data privacy implications are absolutely intertwined. Thank you. So I have one last question for the both of you. Do AI will take the jobs of attorneys? What do you think both? <laughs> Uh, so the actual advice that is given to our clients, I would say it's not going to take those jobs, that bespoke type of advice that we give. AI, um, they, those are tools that we use in order uh, to provide that advice, to give that advice. And so I think that's how we need to uh, think of it as a tool to do our job. I agree, of course, it's a tool, but I would ask, does your human involvement uh, mean something or bring something additional? Because uh, you know, lawyers perform a number of activities and I would say it depends on the lawyer's role. Um, are you stamping documents? Are you just repeating what the law says? If you're doing that, make your human involvement count. Thank you, Anna. And I would like to give you uh, a, a few seconds to so you can provide a final remark, each of you, and I will end with my remark. Great. Um, so my advice uh, to everyone is to do your homework. Um, I am going to also recommend, like Tom did in the previous section, that you uh, view the Netflix documentary Coded Bias. It's about an hour and a half or a little longer, and it's got some excellent, excellent uh, issues for you to think about. Another book that I would uh, recommend is Weapons of Math destruction, how big data increases inequality and threatens democracy by Kathy O'Neill. So do your homework. There's a lot out there for you to, to that will help you understand what the issues are. Excellent recommendation, Molly. And I have a couple of final remarks. Uh, I say, remember that AI can't be bribed, but it also can't raise moral objections to anything it's asked to do. So it doesn't understand the problem, but it will reach its goal, your goal. And the other one is that accuracy falls short attributing it to Plato this quote, only the dead have seen the end of war. Ah. But paraphrasing it and applying it to what the previous speaker discussed in their presentation, we could say that only the dead have seen the end of bias. And I have a couple of recommendations also. What to think about machines that think a wonderful compilation of essays, and um, Who You Can Trust by Rachel Butzman. 
And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have homework to do, and I would like to end this with uh, with a quote: uh, "Nothing is lost, and nothing is created. Everything is transformed." There is no doubt that AI is transforming the legal profession and its boundaries. Although it remains to be seen the extent of such transformation, be sure that we are being and will be part of that transformation. That is why at Coil and Lovells Mexico, we have launched a new area to deal with digital, digital technologies such as AI. So that, that will be the end of our presentation. And please let us know if there are any comments or questions. Federico, okay, thank you. Uh, well, you make it very simple for me. You already made your own questions, your own answers, <laughs> and that was super complete and very, very well-made questions. Time management has been spectacular, and the content that you brought to the table and to the summit has been invaluable. Uh, thank you very much. It's amazing to share with the audience what a global law firm of your uh, caliper has been doing internally in AI and other technologies. And also we have heard from other speakers what's out there in the, in the market for pro perhaps uh, smaller firms that don't have the, the muscle that you have. And they can also have access to technologies on a, on a much uh, more pay pay as go service, but this has been quite uh, an eye opener. Uh, Juan, I don't know if you want to wrap up with some questions or comments. I don't think no, no more questions. What I think is, as you mentioned, just to to thank uh, Anna, Federico, Molly for a great uh, explanation and and the road that you have followed to really jump into these uh, real life scenarios and practical client center scenarios of uh, applying artificial intelligence to, to your legal services. That's something that we have heard from uh, many of all of our speakers throughout the three days of the legal summit. And an important mention is that uh, law firms are really transforming everything in terms of how they are reacting to this. Obviously, there are different maturity levels, as Alice mentioned, different sizes and complexities and macro macroeconomic uh, environments that, uh, you know, are different country by country and region by, by region and the type of uh, activities of big law firms of medium size or small law firms. Uh, participants in these events fall on under all of the categories uh, I just mentioned. So it's, it's a well-rounded, set of uh, topics that we included in the agenda because we wanted to be sure that everybody had kind of their own interest uh, uh, address. And, and it was very important to hear from a, from a law firm like Hogan uh, on what you are doing and what uh, are your capabilities in this type of uh, challenges and, and especially in the opportunities that lie ahead. AI is all over the place. Uh, legal transformation is happening today. Uh, you gave us great examples about it, and we heard about some other good practical approaches uh, in the past two days. And it's a well-rounded analysis, I think, that uh, what we were able to achieve with 19 amazing speakers throughout this legal summit. We come to an end. Uh, it went faster than what we thought. Uh, really the most important part is the participation from so many people around the world from so many support organizations that made this happen and and, and the amazing uh, sponsors that alice will mention and again thank you for a great presentation it's been a tremendous honor to have uh, these quality uh, high level impact speakers throughout the legal summit and it's just another call that motivates us to continue building and sharing the information on something that is transforming all of us in the legal industry and not only lawyers anybody engaged in the legal industry that they're uh, investors coders uh, marketing people economists finance people uh, developers and so on this is much more than lawyers in the legal industry this is anybody involved in this legal ecosystem 
that is able to transform by using these new tools and new technologies to be, at the end of the day, more effective and more efficient. And again, thank you. And with that, I'll take it to Alex for the last round of uh, slides. And uh, it's all you, Alex. OK, just uh, let me wrap it up. And well, just uh, again, and for the final time today, thank you very much to our media partners. Foro Jurídico, iCrowd, Newswire, Lex Latin, the Latin American Lawyer, Iberian Lawyer, In-House Community, U.S., Latin Lawyer, Abogacia, Derecho Practico, Legal Business World, Leaders League, and Leader Legal. Thank you for your amazing promotion of this event. And also, once again, to our support organizations around the globe, uh, most of them in Mexico, in the U.S., but we also have friends in Singapore, in America, uh, South America, Europe, uh, Australia. So without their support and their expansion of this information, we wouldn't have reached all the 40 nationalities that we were able to reach in this event. Um, thank you very, very much. A word of wisdom, get closer to, sorry, get closer than ever to your customers. So close, in fact, that you tell them what they need well before they realize it themselves. Uh, that's a quote from Steve Jobs. Uh, many, many of our speakers have been talking about data and knowing, well, obviously knowing from ourselves, but also knowing deeply from our customers and being very, very customer focused and oriented. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thanks our amazing sponsors. I manage logistic net documents, Hogan Lovells that we just had the amazing presentation, Esija, Genius Soft, Deloitte Legal, Thomson Reuters, Lexsoft Systems, and until the next event, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for choosing us over other events that uh, are the, out there. And we really appreciate your time, your preference, and we really hope that you uh, enjoy and learn from this amazing lineup of speakers that we were able to put together for this Legal Summit 2021. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thanks for joining. See you soon.